and Asian Americans Advancing Justice, California. Our topic is the acute shortage of accredited Asian language teachers in California and its impact on the education options of Asian language speaking students. We will also learn about a bill currently before the state legislature to address the shortage. We have a number of reporters serving Spanish language, Arabic language, and other uh, immigrant speaking communities. And they may have questions about accredited teachers in their languages as well. All questions are welcome. I remind our speakers to speak slowly for our interpreters in Mandarin and Korean, speaking slowly as I'm doing now. Reporters, please enter your questions in the chat box. We will send a recording of today's briefing to all attendees by early this afternoon, along with collateral material prepare, prepared for, by Asian Americans Advancing Justice in Multiple Languages. And now I introduce our co-host, Victoria Nikki Dominguez, Policy Director for AAHA. Ms. Dominguez, welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. So again, my name is Nikki Dominguez. I am the Policy Director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles, one half of Asian Americans Advancing Justice California. And today we're gonna to be talking about the very critical and very concerning shortage of accredited dual immersion language teachers in California. A problem that is very important for all of our education systems, but especially for the Asian American community that continues to face language access and identifies language access as the number one barrier to access to the services that our community needs, including equitable and fair education for all of our students. According to the California Department of Education, more than a thousand bilingual accreditations were issued in 2019-2020 academic year. But out of all of the thousand, only 89, so less than 100, um, were accredited for Asian languages collectively. It is unacceptable when Vietnamese and Mandarin and a collection of many other Asian languages continues to be spoken in our communities uh, with Mandarin, with Vietnamese being the first and um, uh, Mandarin being the third most spoken language in our public K through 12 systems. Yet only four teachers were accredited in Vietnamese, four, and only 58 were to, um, accredited to teach Mandarin in our schools. To address this problem, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it, but one of the ways that we're doing is to work together to invest in the pipeline for these teachers, right? So we must invest in the California State University Asian Language um, Bilingual Teacher Education Program Consortium. The consortium um, is a alliance among 10 uh, CSU, so California State Universities, that have come together to work to increase the numbers of accredited bilingual teachers in six current languages, six Asian current languages, which include Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, Hmong, Korean, and Vietnamese. The consortium yet does not have any of the resources they need to successfully recruit train and graduate these students and these teachers into our system. That is why Advancing Justice California is calling on all of us to come together to learn more about this issue and bring light to this issue and work together um, for us to address this. One way for us to do it, and we're very excited to talk about and share about, is calling for a one-time budget request from the state for $5 million to be allocated over the course of four years um, to fund towards the, this infrastructure, this consortium, to build the infrastructure needed for us, like we said, to train, to recruit, and support aspiring Asian language teachers um, that are looking to earn the credentials to be able to enter our workforce, our schools, and lead um, our students in their academics as well. 
Uh, with that, it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Pan. Uh, Dr. Pan is the California is a California State Senator and the Chair of the California Asian American Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. Thank you so very much, uh, Nikki, and thank you for that introduction. And again, really appreciate the leadership of uh, Asian Americans advancing justice. I'm Dr. Richard Pan. I am a pediatrician, an educator, and also the state center representing the Sacramento region. And I'm proud to be also chair of the California Asian American and Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. Our caucus supports a critical effort of Asian Americans advancing justice, California, more than 25. AAPI groups across California to ensure that we are acting to invest in accrediting more K-12 Asian language bilingual teachers to teach in dual immersion classrooms in our public schools. We're working tirelessly to ensure that the API community is visible and that our needs are prioritized. And as you heard, uh, there are very few uh, teachers who are Asian language bilingual teachers who are teaching dual immersion classrooms. Uh, there's, but yet there's tremendous demand for that as well. So we need to meet that need. Now in 2020, I co-chaired the Senate Committee on the Census with my good friend and colleague, Senator Umberg. And it was so very important that we counted everyone in California. And that includes the Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. And in fact, that outreach uh, to uh, showed that we are one of the fastest growing, actually one of the fastest growing um, uh, sort of racial ethnic group in, in the state. But in order to actually be able to measure that, we had to make sure the state appropriated sufficient resources to reach hard to count communities because many of the individuals uh, are immigrants, Asian American immigrants with limited English proficiency. Uh, and so we had to be sure that in order for us to accurately document this, we actually had to be sure we had the resource to do that. And as chair of the caucus, I helped uh, also, uh, so we need to be sure we had those resources. Now, this year as well as chair of the AP API Legislative Caucus, we also knew that there was tremendous needs to uh, address the unfortunate rise in anti-Asian hate and uh, other needs for our community. And so uh, we proposed and helped pass a historic $166.5 million uh, API equity budget to increase anti-bias education, to support ethnic media outreach, and invest in tracking and preventing anti-AAPI hate crimes and discrimination. But this work is far from done. And so um, in order to address raising uh, rising anti-AAPI hate and combat xenophobia against our community, we need to approach in all angles. Now, one of the priorities in our equity budget last year was actually to address uh, the environment in schools and, and bullying. Uh, but one of the other things that we also made note in our proposal last year was around language access. Now, actually, unfortunately, we did not get as much money for language access uh, that uh, 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 from our proposal last year as we would like. And so this year we are having a particular focus on both language access and continuing to work on the visibility, visibility of our community. And, and part of that is educating our children about API culture and languages. Research shows that children participating in dual immersion language programs develop a greater understanding and empathy for others with different backgrounds and cultures. Dual immersion language classrooms also benefits Asian students who are English learners. In fact, 66% of Asian Americans speak a language other than English at home. Children who grew up, grow up speaking their native language at home can face academic and social challenges. In fact, Asian language speaking teachers provide these students with a sense of belonging, help them build confidence, and better prepare them for academic success throughout their school careers. Unfortunately, we don't have enough accredited Asian language teachers, and that's why we must invest in the California State University, our university system that actually trains our teachers in the Asian Bilingual Teacher Education Program Consortium. We can help address the challenges in recruiting and training future bilingual teachers with a modest but critical $5 million investment in consortium 
Although I know it's a one-time request, I think uh, we want to follow up on that in the future if there's the opportunity. But certainly we need to get this started. And maybe before I end, I just want to share a personal story because uh, when I grew up and I went to elementary school, I actually only spoke Mandarin Chinese. And unfortunately, not only was there not dual immersion program, mainly this was also not in California, it was on the East Coast. Um, the school district decided that because I didn't speak English, that I essentially went to what was then the equivalent of special education. IDEA ended up been passed because I didn't speak English. And so, um, uh, so basically the school district treated me because I didn't, you know, English was not my first language, was not the first language of my family who were immigrants. My parents had both immigrated to the United States that basically I was, the, the answer to that was not dual immersion program, uh, but was to be put into a uh, special needs you know, program, a special education type program. And that's not, you know, what we need to see happen. And in fact, uh, we need to be sure that every child, uh, no matter what language they speak at home and how they got here, has the opportunity to get an outstanding education. And that not only benefits that child, it benefits the whole state. So this is an important investment. It's a small but critical investment. I do want to thank Professor Fernando rodriguez Vales from CSU Fullerton for your leadership and consortium. I want to thank all of you for your work and your leadership in this issue. And I look forward to uh, uh, seeing get funded and hopefully Im implemented. So thank you so very much. Dr. Pan, it is such a uh, great opportunity for us to have you on the call, could we take a few questions? Yes. Great. We have a question from Sunita Sarabji. Sunita, do you want to ask your question? Uh, un unmute yourself, Sunita. Hi, um, uh, Senator Pan. I wanted to ask a question of uh, both you and Nikki. It came immediately to mind as Nikki laid out the standards. Um, what are the standards for accreditation and do they themselves pose a barrier to people who are potentially qualified to be teachers? So maybe I'll, Nikki, do you wanna take that on first? Sorry, I was just gonna ask you if you can um, ask the question again. Okay, absolutely. So what are the standards for accreditation and do are they too high? Do they themselves pose a barrier to potentially qualified teachers? Absolutely. So for so for Asian languages, they go through the same teaching credential program, a normal, you know, every mainstream teacher, but then they have to show uh, proficiency and expertise in a different language, then take those courses to be able to teach not only the language, but be culturally competent in teaching that language in which they want to be accredited. So this is actually like an expertise, being a specialist in education, you get that extra education. And what we've seen is that the, the standard is not high, especially because a lot of the teachers that, are, that want to become Asian language teachers are actually from our communities and spoke these languages at home. The challenge that we see, and we can talk a little bit more about it later, is that they're actually being unfairly um, asked to pay more to become accredited. Um, so because the classes are small, we have a hard time recruiting and supporting these students, they actually have to um, do these accreditations during the summer in extension, right? And that means that a lot of times their financial aid um, or extra hours they have to pay. So they're actually paying an undue and unfair financial burden to become the teachers our students need. And that has been what these teachers have communicated to us, the number one barrier and for them to get accreditation to be teaching Asian languages here in California. Okay. Yeah. Could I ask a follow-up question? No, Would that be okay? Uh, Sunita, Sunita, Dr. Penn has to leave, so I want to give okay. him the last but, word on this. Yeah, and actually, uh, and I, I appreciate that question is that the major barrier is financial. I would also make note, uh, um, you know, as, as someone who's in healthcare field, that, um, you know, when we talk about health literacy and education, you want to be sure the person who's communicating that information, whether they're speaking English or they're speaking in another language, that they are able to communicate it in a way that's effective so that the person receiving it actually uh, is receiving the appropriate education. And obviously for teacher, that's even more important than simply trying to convey health information. information. So, uh, so I certainly appreciate you raising the issues. Are we making the barrier too high? 
uh, at the same time, we have we do have to assure that even if they have a you know that they they have a uh, basic knowledge of the language, let's say they speak it at home, uh, that they're able to actually teach in that language as well and effectively teach the material in that language. So if they're not able to do that, you know, we need to be able to assess that as well. So, um, so I, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, one last question, Dr. Penn. What is it that is limiting support at this critical time for language access issues of which this is such an obvious uh, component. What do you think explains the failure of the legislature to come together to support greater language access issues? Well, I think there's several issues at play. So uh, language access itself is not necessarily uncontroversial. And it hasn't wasn't that long ago where you had people talking about, well, if you're in this country, you just need to learn English, right? That sentiment still exists out there. And so, so that has sometimes put barriers to investments in, um, in, in language. The other part is, is that the challenge for our community is, is that we speak many languages. Right. Uh, so while there have been certainly investments, and I'm not saying there's necessarily been enough investment in, for example, Spanish language uh, or uh, other some other languages, that um, uh, there is a barrier that I've noticed uh, when I've uh, worked with state agencies in terms of outreach to the AAPI community. So they'll say, "Oh, okay. Well, we'll do the top three or the top five most spoken languages." Okay. Well, that's fine, and some of them often are Asian languages, but there are a lot of AAPI communities get left out, right? Um, uh, so uh, when that happens. And uh, the other challenge, and one of the things we tried to address uh, in the past and we're gonna continue to work on is building that capacity and valuing it, right? So for example, uh, too often what happens is that when you need someone to interpret, someone just goes around, hey, does anyone speak that language around here, right? Uh, or is your, I mean, the healthcare is terrible. They, they ask, you know, they, they count on the children. Think about how many AAPI families where the children, even if they're underage, right, are sitting there translating for their parents or their, you know, uh, uh, their grandparents or whoever else. So uh, that's. You're, you're being called back. Right. You're needing. And... But, but I'm just saying that. Uh, so, so we need to recognize this as an important need. And then finally, I, and this, this sort of addresses the data equity issue, right? Um, and one reason we put that investment in last year's AAPI equity budget is that too often, this is about visibility, research on the needs of communities is not focused on the AAPI community. Right. And so if you look at research papers, and I used to be a faculty member at UC Davis, you see, you know, white, black, Latino, and other. Right. And so what happens is that people aren't studying the needs of our community. And ironically, one of the reasons they don't study the needs of our community is because they themselves don't pay for the in language capacity to reach out to our community to collect that data. In fact, when I was leading the census committee, one of the things we really emphasize is language access, right? We need to count the AAPI community. And why is it so important? It wasn't just so we get appropriate representation in Congress, that was really important, but also is that that helps define the need, right? So if you don't know how many people are Cambodian in the state of California, then when it comes to designing the budget, do we need to spend money on specific particular needs for the Cambodian community. And they go, well, how many are there? Well, we don't know, or it's very small because we didn't do the outreach. Then we don't invest the money in it, right? So the good news is now we know we have less than a hundred Asian language speaking, uh, certified language uh, for, for dual immersion programs, right? I mean, how much, 86 or something? I don't remember what the number was. I mean, it's under a hundred. We have almost 40 million people in the state of California, one in six, is AAPI, and yet we only have less than 100, and I think that only covers two languages. So clearly we are not there. But if we don't measure it, people tell us, well, where's the problem? 
Okay, thank you. There are a million other questions, but I know your uh, colleague is saying they need you yes. back. Yes. Oh, yeah. And we really appreciate it and want to have you back again. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll, we'll go back to uh, Nikki Dominguez to kind of finalize these initial starting points before we go to our subject matter expert, Dr. Um, Rodriguez Valls. So, uh, Ms. Dominguez, one quick question that I have, which is you mentioned Vietnamese is mm -hmm. the most uh, widely spoken Asian language or mm -hmm. foreign language, non English language in the school district. We, which is it? And how did that happen? Because my impression was that immigration from Vietnam had not been at the highest level of, say, other groups like uh, Burmese or Nepalese even. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, one of the important things that we need to always talk about when we talk about language access is it, it is an asset. Right. I think sometimes in our public education system, when a child does not speak English, right, like Dr. Pan share, there's something wrong with them. But in, in our communities, what we know is that our home languages are very important and they're very valuable. But one of the things we don't often talk about is that limited English proficiency um, percentages in the Asian American community is the highest in all immigrant communities, meaning that the Asian American adult population has the highest percentage of limited English proficient um, adults in the state. And these are the parents that then going to speak these languages at home with their children. And so when their kids enter the school system, they're coming in with that amazing wealth of their home country, parents' home country language. And again, this is at a higher rate than the Latinx community. Um, so we, we see that a lot of more of the students entering our system, even if immigration stories have changed, on trends have changed, um, the percentage of uh, homes that still speak their native language in the Asian American community is higher a, a lot of times. Um, the Vietnamese community in California has the highest uh, limited English proficient adult percentage, meaning that the vast majority of Vietnamese Americans speak Vietnamese at home and in their communities um, in comparison to other Asian um, communities and the Latinx community as well. So that's what we'll see a higher percentage of students entering our school system with having um, Vietnamese being still their first language. Thank you for that. Uh, one final question from the chat is where would you put Korean in the limited English proficient lineup? Yeah, we can absolutely share that data. We actually did an amazing demographic report last year regarding language accessibility, and we can share that um, post this um, this. Uh, um, event. Um, one of the things that we can, sh again, continue to share is depending on the geographic area of the state, you'll have higher, bigger pockets of community members. But, but again, we have to remember that the Asian American community is so diverse and rich um, that it's very hard to find those pockets. So when we give that information, uh, please see it as like a global kind of California kind of Snapchat. Um, uh, snapshot, sorry, snapshot of kind of the state. And so what, what we'll see in the data will be the different rankings based on um, self-reported uh, information from different communities. And we can share that uh, after this event. That's terrific. So with uh, your agreement, I will move on to Dr. Fernando Rodriguez Valls, our next speaker with Cal State University Fullerton College of Education Bilingual Authorization Program Coordinator. And again, we will be sending expanded bios and contact information for all our speakers after today's conference. So Dr. Rodriguez Valls, welcome and thank you for joining us. And I think you need to unmute 
Dr. Rodriguez Valls. Welcome, Dr. Rodriguez Fowles. He's unmuted, but we can't hear him. We can't hear, hear you or see you, but basically we want to hear you. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, You're on the no, air. Thank Sorry, thank you. No, I'm, I, I, I want to apologize because I'm at on a school site for my, one of my summer projects, um, and I'm here, so I don't I don't have access to a, a computer to Zoom. Uh, and I, I want to thank for the time that you're allowing me to share some of and add what my colleagues just said. Uh, let me start with uh, what Nikki said in terms of um, what is one of the barriers that we have for our teacher candidates to to get their bilingual authorization is as funding. As you know, most of these classes are being offered over the summer when the students uh, cannot afford financial aid. And they have to take two classes. The average of, of the cost of each class is around $1,200, which adds pretty much to the whole program, $2,500. $2, that will be A. Um, B, adding what Dr. Fan said also, we need a lot of teachers and we need it for three reasons. Number one, uh, the former superintendent Dr. Torlexon uh, charged us with the California Global 2030. And the main quote of, the, uh, of that initiative is that by 2030, which is eight years from now, 75% of the students in California will be at least bilingual, if not plurilingual. Therefore, we need more dual immersion programs. Number two, the ELA roadmap. Do, do, Dr. Rodriguez Valls, could you repeat uh -huh. that number again and speak a little slowly? We're translating yeah. in Mandarin and Korean. Oh, no problem. So I was saying that the support that we're asking for the $5 million is trying to really follow the charge that uh, the former superintendent Tom Torlexon put us with the, Cali the initiative California Global 2030. And the main point of that project is that by 2030, 75% of the students in public schools in California, they will be at least bilingual, if not plurilingual. Uh, right now in California, we have close to 60% of the students who speak a language other than English. Some of them, a lot, thousands of them, they would like to be in dual immersion programs in Asian languages, no? Vietnamese, Korean, Khmer, Mandarin, Unfortunately, because we have a shortage of teachers, sometimes districts are a little bit uh, resistant to really start a program. And the main question that I get from superintendents um, and principals is, do we have teachers? And the answer is, we have some, but we need more. Because as I said, if we wanna have a, California, a global California where we value the plurilingualism, we need the dual immersion program. So that would be, why, why, why we asking for this extra funding to support us so that we can have some scholarships from the for the students so then they don't see the funding as a barrier. But most importantly, it's a big demand. I think what Nikki said is the community wants these dual immersion programs and think about students who acquire high levels of language proficiency in English, but then maybe they go back home and they're not able to communicate with their families. So we want to really maintain what Nikki said in terms of assets. So the students come to the school site with Vietnamese, Mandarin, Korean, Khmer. Can we expand this and add in all the things they can learn? And when we're saying about adding, it's not just learning the languages, learning mathematics in Khmer, learning science in Korean, learning history in Vietnamese. And in order to accomplish that, we need teachers, teachers who are qualified, just through what Nikki said, all the candidates, they need to go through the regular teaching credential program, and they go through, and then after that, at the same time, they go through a specialization program where they add the bilingual authorization, which is the permit that the, best, the state requires for any teacher who wants to teach in a dual immersion program. Right. Uh, professor, could I ask you, we have a number of 
Spanish language reporters, as well as Arabic and other languages. How much is this crisis a uh, lack of accredited uh, dual language teachers? Uh, how much of a problem is it for Spanish language students and Spanish language teachers or it, other it languages? No, that's a great question, sorry. It is the same because think about this. In 1998, Prop 227 passed, pretty much eliminating all the bilingual programs in California. Since then, for 15 years until Prop 58 passed, and pretty much eliminated Proposition 227, we have 15 years where all the education was English only. So right now we have the byproduct of a, an English only educational system. The need for the Spanish is the same. It's the same that we have for Asian languages that we need the support as well. The only difference is that we have more Spanish speaker teacher candidates than Asian uh, speaking teacher candidates, but the need is equal the same. So we programs are growing. If I can add another piece is, so let me put an example, Garden Grove and Westminster, where we have Vietnamese dual immersion programs. These programs go from K to six. If we want to really meet the goal by literacy, we would like to see these programs from TK, from TK to 12th grade, which means that we will need more teachers as these programs right. uh, become. Yeah. Yep. Pro Professor Rodriguez, I hope you will stay on because there are more questions, but I uh -huh. see we're, we're just joined now by Senator Tom Umberg who just got off a plane and is racing to another meeting. So I'm going to pivot to uh, Senator Umberg for his presentation and come back to you directly. So okay. Senator Umberg, welcome. Thank you so much for joining this ethnic media briefing on such an important language access issue. Well, thank you, Sandy, and thank you for Asian Americans advancing justice. This, this is really an important issue. It's an important issue, not just for, uh, for example, um, monolingual uh, speakers of a language other than English. It's an important initiative. It's important that we have fully trained, skilled, uh, bilingual, bicultural teachers uh, for those young people, but also for all of us. What we wanna do is we wanna make sure that our young people are as productive citizens as is possible. And the way to make them most productive is to make sure that, that they are fully functional in at least two languages. Now, I, I'm a bit embarrassed because I'm barely functional in one, um, <laughs> but, but I have seen uh, firsthand the benefits of bilingual education. Just as an aside, my middle, child, one of my sons, uh, was enrolled in an experimental program, Korean English program. He's an English speaker uh, years ago where they took 12 monolingual Korean speakers and they put them in a classroom with 10 monolingual English speakers in uh, pre-K and K and sort of watched how they taught each other language. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Unfortunately, they ran out of money. And so after a year it was discontinued. But having said that, I saw I saw the benefits to my own child um, of of that immersion program. Now, what are we doing? Um, we in our district um, we are um, supportive of and are supportive and have provided budget requests and also a grant program to fund uh, bilingual teachers and also to fund bilingual education. Um, I am blessed to have a very large Vietnamese population in my district, also a very large Spanish speaking population in my district. And it almost brought me to tears to watch a performance of a group from one of the dual immersion programs in Westminster that were trilingual. They performed in English, Vietnamese and Spanish. Now, can you imagine how uh, productive those young people are going to be as, as they enter the workforce someday, having those skills and how lucky we are to have young people with, with those kinds of skills. So um, having said that, um, I want to, again, let me, let me uh, thank Asian Americans for advancing justice uh, for your initiative, uh, both here in the legislature and locally to 
to make sure that, that we do have both teachers, schools, as well as um, the uh, curriculum to benefit all of us. I see, uh, I see Faith Lee is on here somewhere. And I know Faith uh, from both her prior role here in the legislature and also her role in advancing um, Asian Americans advancing justice. Um, so I want a special shout out to Faith. And I'm happy to respond to, there's Faith. She showed us herself there. So um, any questions? And oh, by the way, uh, although I've been around for a long time, I first elected in 1990, representing Little Saigon way back then, um, and been in and out of the legislature multiple times. I am solicitous of uh, advice and, um, and comments. So having said that, let me turn it back over to you, Sandy. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> um, we have a number of questions and I think the most important question is really, what do you think is the most effective means for addressing this acute shortage? Well, um, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and um, I think the most effective thing we can do as legislators is to look at those who have experience and expertise in bilingual education versus trying to figure out ourselves what's most effective. I was here during the debates over you know, dual language immersion, Spanish, English, and legislators all had their point of view as to what was most effective. Um, I'm not an expert in the area, uh, but I know experts in the area. And so for us, it's to uh, take into account, accept and, and uh, accept the counsel and expertise of those who are experts. Now, what can we do? We can provide resources. And we provide resources both at the, uh, for example, in my own individual effort is to provide resources at, at, at Cal State Fullerton uh, to educate bilingual teachers. The other thing that, that we can do is we can send the message as to how important it is. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I emphasize when I go to, to schools where they have um, a significant number of either Asian speakers or, or whatever, whatever speakers is to emphasize to young people what an important calling it is for all of us to become teachers. And so uh, the recruiting aspect is, is another thing. So from our perspective, one, create the structure, two, uh, create the resources, and three, engage in, in recruiting and sending the messages to how important this is. And the message, I know I've said it twice, but I'm gonna say it a third time, is that this is not just about those students who are right now potentially um, English as second language learners. This is important for all of us, including old guys like me that only speak English for the most part. Uh, another question is, how advantageous is it for a state like California to have bilingual, even trilingual capacity in the global economy we're functioning in? Right. Could you speak to that? And sure. I think that that question sort of answers itself, tell you the truth. Um, as we become more integrated, and, and I have been blessed to have spent uh, major portions of my life in other countries, in, in Korea, in um, Europe, in Afghanistan, um, in Latin America. And so it, it is obvious, I think, to anyone who has looked at uh, the global economy in the last 10 years is that as we become more integrated is that we, the United States, and in particular, California, we, we need to be um, both language capable as well as culturally capable to be able to thrive in the economy. I know that, that you know, um, the language of business for the most part is English, but if you really want to do well, then you speak another language and, and you do, I mean, just as, as an aside, is that uh, uh, I still practice law and 50% of our practice is run by a uh, Mandarin speaker um, who is able to communicate um, in both uh, perfect Mandarin as well as being culturally acute uh, and sensitive to um, 
Mandarin speakers, and that's been good for business. Right. We have our subject matter expert, Professor Fernandez Rodriguez Valls, who has to drop off for a teaching assignment in about three minutes. Would you mind, uh, Senator Umberg, if I go to Professor Rodriguez Valls sure. for a final comment sure. and come back for sure. two more questions for you? Uh, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez Valls. Your final comment for us as somebody critically involved in this effort to expand the teacher pool. What do you think the proposed legislation, what difference can it make? And a question in the chat, which is, will $5 million be enough over the next five years if it is focused on Asian languages? What about Spanish? That's a great question. I, I would say that $5 million is a good start. It will really help to support teachers, candidates who want to obtain their bilingual authorization in Asian languages. I know there are other funding that is going to support um, other languages as well. Um, three years ago, we got a grant from the Department of Ed, California Department of Ed, it's called BTPDP, so that we can also create a pipeline uh, of the Spanish teachers you know, to work in the dual immersion programs. Uh, one thing that we want to make sure adding what the senator has said is we live in a plurilingual state, not a bilingual state. So we live in a plurilingual state. So this $5 million will help a lot to support the students um, in Cali State, the Cali State system. But right now, the number one barrier is, as I said, uh, funding money for them to really attend the classes. We are lucky in Cali State Fullerton this summer, we offer the bilingual authorization courses for Spanish, Vietnamese, and Korean. And I have to say that some students, they wanted to be part of the program, but they call me and they say, Dr. Rodriguez Baez, I can't. Uh, I cannot be part of the program because I don't have the, the money to really to pay for these classes. And although there's some scholarships they can apply afterwards, but when I hear that and I would like to have an answer. So can, can I support them financially? This $5 million will help us to start with this. They will then have an impact in the communities, I would say, uh, enlarging the dual immersion programs. It will benefit the community because maintaining the language and maintaining the culture, as has been said by other speakers, is so important, especially in, in a post-pandemic era within the socio-emotional learning how important it is that we are a state that's plurilingual and that we produce professionals, not just teachers, professionals who are plurilingual and they can compete with other professionals from around the world. So yeah, in short, five million is enough? No, <laughs> but it's a good start. And I think that having this investment shows the state and the teachers that we are supporting them. I'm going back to teach later. I'm going to tell, I told the teacher candidates I was going to take this call. So I'm excited about it. So hopefully we can get this $5 million and hopefully other funding comes after that because that's, that's a good start that we will be able to support our communities that are, and our students and to provide the services that we want to provide the asset base, uh, high quality instruction for all, all our language learners in California. Thank you so much. And back to you, Senator Umberg. You are the sponsor of legislation currently uh, wending its way through. What can you tell us about the importance of this bill you're sponsoring for addressing this shortage issue? What happens if it doesn't pass? And there always has to be a plan B, um, but are you hopeful and expanding coverage of the issue is a very important way to educate our communities about the critical shortage? So let me first of all, thank uh, Professor uh, for his comments. And, and I agree with him. Uh, that, that's kind of him say it's a good start. It is a good start. It, I look at um, state funding in particular programs like, for example, bilingual education or uh, educating 
in certifying bilingual teachers as an investment, just like you'd invest in a business. If you're a business person and you say, you know, look, at, I'm going to put some money into this and I'm going to see how it works because I believe in the concept, but I want to see proof of concept. And so now, you know, I, I, I think it works, um, but we need to demonstrate to um, legislators and other leaders in California why it is that it benefits all Californians to have um, people who are proficient in multiple languages. That's our challenge. And so I think we're going to meet that challenge. But to answer your question, Sandy, is if, if we're not successful this year, uh, plan B is to do it again next year um, and continue to do it until uh, a majority of legislators. And I, and I think that I think we've reached that critical mass where a majority of legislators do recognize that, but it's not just legislators, it's also community leaders. And I'm talking about school board members, uh, city council people, all those folks um, who understand the benefit. And this is not a zero sum game. Uh, one of the challenges is that some opponents um, create the straw man that somehow this is a zero sum game. If we're investing money in, by and trilingual education that somehow we're taking money away from other beneficial programs. That's not, one, it's not the case because we're actually adding money, but two, it's not the case is because this is as important as any other educational initiative. So, um, and, I, and I'm sorry, Sandy, that I'm gonna I, maybe take one, one more question. I've got to sign off here in just a second. Okay, I'm going to ask Nikki Dominguez to ask you the question, you feel would be most informative. Nikki, ask your question of Senator Umberg. Absolutely, thank you. Senator Umberg, one of our biggest kind of challenge has been really about how do we bring communities together around issues like language access, right? And you made mention, then we had some legislators, um, but how do we get different communities of color, different communities to talk about why language access for all communities has to be a priority in how we do um, our everyday work? Sure. Um, I, I think it requires a unified front. Um, parents, parents, I think universally want their children to do better than they have done. So whether it's a parent with a monolingual English speaking child or a parent with a child that is learning English as a second language, they're important advocates. Also, some unusual folks, chambers of commerce, whether it's the ethnic chambers of commerce or it's the broader chambers of commerce, I think that's really important. Um, making sure that we elect the right school board members, really important um, that, you know, tomorrow is election day. We've got another election in November where uh, in terms of education, school board members are more important than I am in terms of, of advancing um, issues that are important, like making sure that we have teachers that are qualified to teach in a bilingual or trilingual setting. And the same thing with uh, resources. So uh, that's, I mean, that's part of an answer as to, as to what we can do collectively to deliver the message and advance the cause. Thank you, uh, Senator Umberg. Thank you so much for making sure. time for today's briefing. We will be sending contact information to our media who may have follow-up questions, which I'm sure they will uh, forward to your staff. Sure. But uh, it, it's uh, tremendous to have both you and Dr. Pan on today's briefing. Well, Dr. Pan, I'm, I'm honored to be along with Dr. Pan. I understand he spoke before me. I'm gonna ask, and I see you're a very popular group. I've, I've got a few staff members who are on this, uh, this Zoom call. I'm gonna ask, um, one or more of them to post their contact information so that if there are further questions or um, inquiries, we can, we can respond, so. That would be I, great. And we'll share I, a list of the media that attended okay. today's briefing with them. Well, okay. thank you, Sandy. Thank, thank you. you. So thank, you thank you very much. And thank you all, you know, onward. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, now we turn back to our co-host, Nikki, Dominguez. Nikki, one of the things you started 
our briefing with is the fact that consistently in poll after poll, language access is perhaps the single most consistent top ranking issue in Asian Pacific American communities. And I, I think of just having been through the pandemic, how many times our briefings have revealed the language access issue as one of the chief barriers to healthcare information, access to healthcare. It, it's been a consistent theme. Tell us what Asian Americans Advancing Justice's plans are for promoting this component of language access. Tell us your thoughts going forward briefly, and then I will take some final questions for you before closing today's briefing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think for Asian Americans Advancing Justice, language access has and will continue to be one of our flagship issues that we're always going to be pushing forward. Um, we believe that every single one of our community members should have access to the information that they need in order to make the best decisions regarding their education, their careers, health access, and just building the communities that we know are are there for us to build. Um, we believe dignity um, is a founding value and language access is part of that. Um, as we know, education is a pipeline. I, I tell people all the time, and I think Senator Angbar was really hint hinting at this, this is an investment. Right. As we move forward, these students are going to enter our workforce being um, bilingual or multilingual. And these are going to be students in the future that are going to be workers that are going to be able to address the language access issues that we currently see, like in our healthcare um, systems. And so for us, it's really important to look at the assets that our communities bring, but that our students bring to our education system. Our students' native language is not a deficit. It is not them missing something. It is something that enriches them. It can enrich our economy. It can enrich our workforce. And it's really our uh, responsibility to give them the opportunity to do that by giving them the educational options to build on the amazing uh, languages that their families and parents and communities have taught them since birth. And so for us, language access is about that. And so we'll continue to push this forward and we're very much committed um, for this fight. Like Amber said, if we don't get it this year, we'll be back next year and the year after that and the year after that. Um, but we're hoping that folks also help us uplift this issue, share about the challenges that the Asian American community face around language access and the importance of our work moving forward. Could you add a personal story to the need for dual immersion language programs? I think uh, these stories are often the mm. um, most compelling way to convey the message of the briefing. And uh, I have a feeling you may have a personal one to provide. Absolutely. So for me, I was an English learner student, right? Um, having my mom be a parent that had to fight for my right to have the education um, I deserved. Um, and so this is personal for me. This is not something that I read about. Like I lived this. I, I saw my mom's uh, face of shame sometimes when she couldn't communicate with my teachers um, regarding what I needed. Um, but her determined that she was going to do the very best um, in order to make sure that I got what I what um, I believed that I deserved when it came to my education. As an adult, one of the reasons I came into this work in policy was because of this. Um, I used to work in an after school program um, in this uh, helping um, Central American children. And I remember having a Korean mother walk into our after school program office at that time um, with tears in her eyes. And we were like, oh my God, what's going on? Um, because she couldn't fill out the form to be a chaperone for her daughter's trip to the zoo. 
And because she couldn't fill that out, the school uh, wouldn't allow her to take that chaperone class in order for her to be able to go to that trip with her daughter, which was so important to her because she wanted to make those memories with her daughter and her daughter to know that she was there for her. Um, and nobody in that school could help her fill out this application. Nobody in that school could give her the information that she needed in order to become a chaperone for her child's trip. Um, and then I remember just sitting there being so angry um, that I called that school and walked with her back in school and we made a ruckus until somebody from the district was able to come and was able to support. And for, for me, that was so important because a, no parent should ever feel alone in their fight to be able to be present for their children's education. And that really does start by having dual emergence programs and teachers and community leaders that can help build those communities in our schools and make them more welcoming to the diverse community um, that we live in. And, and that's the reality of California, our diversity. And it's rich and it's beautiful, but it is a challenge for us. And it's something that we need to stand by every day and show up every day to do it, um, to do the hard work. And so for me, it was very important as an adult to be that leader that my mom needed and that she had to do and be able to fight that for other students and other families as well. Thank you. A final question before we close, um, inspired by comments in the chat. We're at a point of um, growing realization that inter-ethnic, interracial communication and understanding is critical if we're to address the toxic atmosphere and the rise in anti-ethnic violence. You, as a Span originally a Spanish speaker, are yeah. now working to promote more dual language teachers for Asian and Pacific American speaking students. Tell us just a final thought about the importance of this work for reducing anti-racial violence that affects all communities of color and indeed all of us. Thank you. So dual emergence programs and being bilingual, multilingual, I think Nancy Tran put it perfectly in the chat, um, helps build understanding. Study after study have shown that when we are exposed um, to other communities, other cultures and their other languages, literally our brain rewires in a different way that allows us to be more empathetic, more understanding, but also a lot more um, uh, problem solvers. Um, and so it is very enriching and it's very important for us to do that. The other important thing about multiculturalism is the fact that being multilingual and being multicultural is very different, right? Um, and being able to have classrooms um, that really are about a lifting culture not only helps us like uh, enrich what communities already have, but it, it, it enriches students who otherwise would have not known that. Again, as um, for me, Mexican uh, heritage, coming into Advancing Justice LA and working with Asian American communities have made me a way better person, uh, way better advocate, and has made me a lot more confident in the work that I do and why I stand by stand. And one of the reasons is that is that communities are built by every single one of us. And so as we go forward regarding how do we keep our community safe? How do we enrich? How do we show radical love to one another? That means that we sometimes need to always remember um, that it's not about who looks like us, but making sure that everyone in our communities, regardless of what our differences are, are having the same access to the resources, information, and services that we all deserve. And that means that it's a community that looks out for one another. Well, you couldn't have ended us on a more eloquent note. And I also want to thank Nancy Tran, director of TNT Radio for your comments in the chat. I want to thank all our media for joining today across the racial and ethnic spectrum. This is a topic all of us uh, have to keep high on our 
editorial agenda. And we have an opportunity, thanks to Asian Americans Advancing Justice, organizing today's briefing and bringing two important elected officials to the conference table. With that, my thanks, and we're closing today's conference. Thank you.